Shalom, shalom. Davon Mays here with Clouds of Torah. This will be episode three concerning original sin. Did we all fall with Adam and Eve? <clears throat> and that simple answer is no. What people seem to forget is um, in Genesis chapter three, after they ate from the tree, after the disobedience, what did God say? Lest he reach out his hand and eat from the tree of life and live forever. So the tree was blocked, right? Would that mean Adam would have lived forever, although he had sinned? Yes. So he was blocked from the tree of life, which means we don't die because of sin. We die because we don't have access to the tree of life. So Adam, even if he would have continued to have children, he would have lived forever. So it wasn't the sin that was going to kill him. It was the, it was that he lost access to the tree of life. Go back and read Genesis for yourself, chapter 3. Why were there cherubs and a flaming sword put in front of the tree to keep him from getting to it? Why? If he was going to die from his sin anyway. Think about it. Sin is not what kills you, is you don't have access to the tree of life. So... <clears throat> This verse, Psalm 51 and 5, is what the average um, missionary is going to run to, to say, see, you're born in sin. There's nothing you can do about it. So let's dive into this. So shaping in iniquity, right? Psalm 51, 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So other versions, King James Version says, behold, I was shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So this word for, you know, iniquity is fault, iniquity, mischief, punishment of guilt of iniquity, sin. So <clears throat> what exactly is going on in Psalm 51 verse 5? Well, let's read the whole chapter because if we cherry pick stuff, you can find anything. If you cherry pick, you can make anything say whatever you want if you take it out of context. But. Proverbs 22 and 15 tells us foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So even if you are prone to make mistakes or have the capacity to make mistakes, you can correct them. Because if foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, if we replace the word foolishness with sin, it says, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. That means it can be fixed. Foolishness can be fixed. Sin can be fixed. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. <clears throat> Here's proof. Psalm 32, 1 through 6. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. So how is that even possible if you have original sin and you don't have the New Testament doctrine of the blood of Jesus? It says, whose sin is forgiven. Blessed is he whose, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. How is that possible? In whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. A confession. He confessed and he was forgiven. Selah. For this cause, everyone who is godly should pray to you. <laughs> in the time when you may be found, surely in flood, in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. So <clears throat> For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. Why? Because when you confess your sins, you get forgiveness. Under the Christian doctrine of original sin, this is not possible. There is no Jesus here. There is no blood here. Now, today, we don't have a sacrificial system. David did. And we're going to get to that. But right here, it says... I acknowledge my sin. I confessed and you forgave my iniquity. Go and read the account of David, Nathan, when he says, I have sinned. 
And Nathan says, God has already forgiven you. You will not die. David didn't give a sacrifice. He confessed his sin. Go read it. So under original sin, this is not even possible. So if we go back to Psalm 51, if he's born in sin or born with the capacity to sin, born with the capacity to make mistakes, this is what's going on here. He can still fix it. He can correct it just like this child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You can fix things. So let's read this in context. Psalm 51, 1 through 5. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. How is that possible? Why would David be asking for something that's not possible? For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin, and in sin my mother conceived me. So before he says he was brought forth in iniquity, he's asking God to forgive him and blot out his transgressions and cleanse him. If that's not possible, what's the point? You're wasting breath. You're wasting ink writing all this stuff down. For us to read 3,000 years later, if it doesn't even matter, what's the point? Again, verse three, for I acknowledge my transgressions. That's how you get forgiveness. Acknowledge what you did. Show some remorse. Psalm 51, six to 11. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. How can he be clean if he has original sin? Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. How is that possible? Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Why would he be asking for something that is not going to happen? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Wait a minute. He had Holy Spirit even though he was born in sin? How did he get that? He says, don't take it from me. After he made the sin, he will be clean and continue to have. How will he be clean and continue to have Holy Spirit with the original sin? He's saying, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. How is this possible? You see, when you read the whole thing in context, you can make it understandable. Or like they say today, make it make sense. You can make it make sense if you read the whole thing in context. Psalm 51, 12 to 16, restore to me the joy of your salvation restore so that means he had the salvation he messed it up but he's about to get it back how did he get salvation in the first place you know david saved people and was saved out of many situations how is this possible with the original sin how does he even know what salvation is to say restore it to me if something's going to be restored that means he had it before and uphold me by your generous spirit then I will teach transgressions, transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. If, he, if God does not want the sacrifices, what does he want? That's not what he really wants. Sacrifice, sacrifices are a part of a, of a system that the Levites, you know, were in charge of. But what did he really want? He wanted obedience. Sacrifice is like making a payment. You know, when you, when you break something, you got to pay for it, right? You knock down somebody's fence, you got to pay for the repairs. That's like giving a sacrifice. You got to give up something. Psalm 51, 17 through 19, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Remorse, 
a broken and contrite heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. Very serious repentance. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with whole with burnt offering and whole burnt with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So since David had a uh, a tent of meeting, a tabernacle, he could offer sacrifices. But you notice he repented and he was forgiven. And remember, all sacrifices ain't for sin. There's Thanksgiving sacrifices too. <clears throat> the problem is, Hebrews 10 and 11 says, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Then how did David get his sins taken away? He says, you forgave me. I read it. He said, you forgave me. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. How is this possible? If Even after David gave his sacrifices, how does Hebrews say that these sacrifices can never take away sins? How does, that, how does he get to say that? Where does he get that from? Because when I read in the book of Leviticus, it says if you take your, your sacrifice to the priest, he will, you know, do put it on the altar and it says you will be forgiven of your sins. So how does Hebrews 10 and 11 says, which can never take away sins. So what's the Christian answer? Well, because you still die. Well, guess what? Everybody who believed in Jesus and his blood still die too. So you can't use that. If you're going to say, if the sacrificial system was so good, why do people still die? Why, after 2,000 years, everybody who ever believed in Jesus still die? Because like I said before, they don't have access to the tree of life. <laughs> Think about it. He that is without sin. So this original sin concept really has a, is a big problem, even in the New Testament. It's not even supported in the New Testament. If the stain of original sin did not end until Jesus came, explain how the congregation of Israel, who would be stained with original sin, could have had any capital punishments because God never said anything to them about being sinless in order to carry out capital punishments. So... John 8 and 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So a lot of scholars will tell you this account was added. It's not in some manuscripts. This is any and this would have never happened because it kind of makes Jesus. Make up laws. This is this is not a law in Israel. This couldn't have been a law in Israel. And Jesus says in Luke 16, 17, none of the law will pass away till heaven and earth pass away, which heaven and earth hasn't passed away. So add into the Torah, Deuteronomy 4 and 2, you don't do that, especially when it comes to these capital punishments in the land of Israel with the Sanhedrin, right? If they had a Sanhedrin, which, of course, at this time, the Romans didn't allow them to kill anybody, according to the book of John. Since we're in John, John chapter, oh, what is it chapter eighteen or, or chapter eighteen or nineteen, talks about they took Jesus to Pilate and he's like, you know, you judge him according to your law, and they're like, no, nah, we can't kill him, so we brought him to you. Mm -hmm. So he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. So if everybody has original sin, nobody could ever cast a stone at her, right? We got a problem. All the congregation of Israel would have had original sin, according to this doctrine, right? If it came from Adam, everybody would be infected with it. Leviticus 24, 14 through 16. Bring forth him that has cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. 
And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. He that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. Now, I know you're going to tell me, well, actually, I know you're not going to tell me that Israel in the wilderness was not sinless, was they? They made a lot of mistakes in the wilderness. The golden calf, challenging Moses and Aaron, the quails. I mean, Israel was just, you know, putting in work, right? <laughs> so Exodus 32 and 9, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. What we translate today as hard-headed. Deuteronomy 9 and 6, therefore understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because you are righteous, because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Y'all hard-headed. Y'all be messing up. Deuteronomy is basically Moses saying, look, man, we done went through all this stuff. And as soon as I die, y'all going to continue y'all stuff. They're going to take y'all show on the road. The nonsense. Numbers 30, Numbers 15, 32 through 35. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they found, and they they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not, excuse me, it was not declared what should be done unto him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall surely be put to, put to death all the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. If only people without sin can pass judgment according to Jesus, how could you ever have a system of justice with everyone having original sin? You can't. So when Jesus says he who was without sin cast the first stone, where did he get that from? Now, figuratively speaking, I can understand a point of, you know, you can't judge nobody if you're doing the same thing, right? If you're a thief, you can't really, I mean, you can, because they, they're still a thief too. If they're stealing, you're stealing, y'all stealing. But can you really pass judgment if you're doing the same thing? It just makes you look bad, right? So if these people were the, that, that brought uh, Jesus, the woman committing adultery, if they was committing adultery too or similar crimes, then like, who are y'all to be trying to, you know, get somebody in trouble? But if you was to take the passage literally, saying he was without sin, cast the first stone, because you know this is what Christians use for original sin. Nobody could ever have a court system or a capital punishment. It doesn't work because according to that, everybody has sin. So this right here. Israel could never obey God and kill anybody, sentence him to sentence sentence anyone to death because they all had original sin. They could have never cast the first stone. It doesn't work. Israel has sin. Joshua 7 and 11. So in John 8 and 7, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a, cast first, let him first cast a stone at her. Remember in the book of Joshua, Joshua 7 25, Joshua said, Why has I don't know, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. And after they had stoned them with stones, we see clearly that the nation was were sinners and still carrying out um, still carrying out capital punishments. This new doctrine of being sinless in order to stone someone would have never allowed the people to obey the commands of God. So they could have never did, did any type of capital punishment. In the book of Joshua, we see it in the book of Numbers. Uh, remember in the golden calf, it says, take your sword and kill your brother, right? Because everybody who worshiped the, the statue, the, the Levites could have never done that because they all would have had original sin. So, Reading John 8 and 7, you see, no, nah, this is just, you know, kind of figurative, figuratively talking. But in real time, you can't have a court system with this type of literal interpretation of John 8 and 7. It doesn't work. 
So we see Psalm 51 doesn't work in context because if you put Psalm 51 in context, it tells you David was forgiven. Even if he was born in sin or the, with the capacity to make those mistakes, like I showed Adam was because if Adam didn't have a parent, where did he get the capacity to make mistakes? He wasn't born into sin. It wasn't passed on to him. Everybody is born with free will. Like I showed him in part one. If you have free will, you can make mistakes all day and you can correct those mistakes. We see in Psalm 51, David acknowledged his sin. He said he was sorry and he was forgiven. Now, according to the book of Hebrews, the animals sacrifice never took away sins. Well, if that was true, God was wasting everybody's time in the wilderness. And when Solomon built that temple, this stuff doesn't work, right? What's the point? What's the point? And if you're going to say, oh, it's a shadow leading up to Jesus. Well, guess what? You still die listening and praying to Jesus, too. So if you die because of sin, Jesus don't work either. If you're going to use that logic. So <clears throat> something else to chew on. Read Psalm 51 in context. Read Psalm 32 and read John 8 and 7 and try to apply it. It doesn't work. You can't have capital punishment if you have the original sin doctrine. So we'll see you next time. Shalom.